And one of our most common hopes is that God is going to find a way to take something awful, something that we, we struggle with, a tragedy of some sort, and he's going to use it for his good purposes, that there's something good that's going to come from it, whatever it might be. I mean, as Christians, we know God promises that, that he says no matter what it is, God uses all things for the good of his people, it says in Romans 8, 28. Um, and yet there's always a part of us that's afraid that maybe in our particular instance, God's not going to live up to his end of the deal. A constant fear that, that maybe whatever happened to us is just tragic and, and there's no good that God brings from it. And at times, we'll even go fishing in the dark. We'll look for this or that situation and we'll say that maybe this is the good that God intended from that situation. And, but at the end of the day, it, it's not as if God tells us that. Finally, that's just peering into what's called the hidden will of God, the things that God wants that, to be honest, he just hasn't told us about. But God always does what he says. And he brings good from bad. We have a chance to see that in the case of the Apostle Paul. I always remember someone saying that when someone gets in a boat in the Bible, it should make you a little nervous because for the most part, when that happens, something interesting is about to take place. And so Noah gets into his boat and the whole world is flooded. And so Jonah gets into a boat for the other side of the world from the place where God told him to go and he's shipwrecked, swallowed by a fish. You hear about all the times of the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee and everything that took place there. And in our lesson, the Apostle Paul gets on a ship. And just for a moment, we'll have a chance to trace uh, with him on a map, uh, looking where, he's, where he had went in his different stops. First of all, and, and maybe just kind of on, on this side of me, you see him in Judea, and they stop in Sidon to begin with, where he meets with some of the other Christians there who provide for his needs. And then they continue kind of up the coastline. You see Myra right behind my head there. They stop there and they end up getting on a different ship, an Alexandrian one, one from Egypt. And that one is headed towards Rome. And so they end up going from Myra and then they cross over to Crete. And, and they find some bad weather that forces them out that direction. They end up at a harbor there and Paul urges them to stay put. But they want to try to get to a different harbor on the island of Crete that's a little better. You can see that there where it says Phoenix. That's where they're trying to get. But one day they get the winds they think are best. They set out from where they were, Fair Havens, to get to Phoenix. And then suddenly this nor'easter erupts, what we might call a hurricane or a tropical storm. And it carries them out to the middle of the ocean. That They end up abandoning all hope. That They throw the ship's tackle overboard. They do all they can to try to stay afloat. But they're sure that there's no hope. But what's interesting is in the middle of that just hopeless situation and just a, a tragedy, the Apostle Paul gives them something to hold on to, a promise from God. We read about that um, in our first section from Acts chapter 28, 27. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage. Because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen to me just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. The people facing death in what is a terrifying situation. Out in the middle of the ocean, if you've ever been out in the ocean on a ship, maybe in the middle of a storm, you know just how powerless you are, how big that ocean is. And yet to people that are just clinging on to, to nothing, God gives them the same thing we hold on to in life. A promise. A promise that, that God is going to save their lives. Think of all the promises we hold on to our life. Is it really any different from us? We have no leverage, no way to make God do what he says, no way to make God keep his promise, but we hold on to the hope that God is going to raise us from the dead, that God has forgiven my sin, that God has sent the angels to protect me, that God is watching over me and doing all the things he promises to do. And we hold on to that hope for dear life. It's our lifeboat in the middle of a tragic situation. And you can't be in more than one lifeboat. In each of the next sections, we see the people having to grapple between the promise of God and what they might do to try to better their own situation. And in each case, they can't do both. They either hold on the promise or they abandon it. We read about the first section from Acts chapter 27. 
On the fourteenth night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea, when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. You see, God, he won't be our backup plan. Faith is not saying, what do I have to lose? I'm going to believe God will do this, but I'm also going to do other stuff I really believe in more. That's not how it works. You see, faith holds on to God's promise and nothing else. It doesn't mean that's inactivity. It doesn't mean you don't still do what you think is best to do. Oftentimes, God answers prayer through the actions of the people doing what, what seems right, what seems best. But that doesn't change the fact that we're holding on to God's promise. All our eggs have to be in that basket. And this first section, you see the sailors about to let down the, the lifeboat and just kind of steal away from the ship, leave the soldiers and the prisoners to their own devices. But Paul makes clear, if you leave the ship, you leave the promise. At the end of the day, you hold on to the promise. Look at the next test we see in the next verses. It says, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate food, ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. You know, dead men, they don't eat. They have no need for it. And yet, Paul tells them that they should eat. They should keep their strength up. You know, it, it's a small thing, but it's a reminder of, of Paul's unwavering confidence that God is going to do what he says here. He will not let them down. And so they eat. But this next test is maybe the biggest. Look what happens next. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea, and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Finally, the, the biggest choice of all was what to do with the prisoners. You see, for a Roman soldier, if they let those prisoners escape, there were harsh consequences that awaited them. In some cases, even death. And they didn't want to face that. The safe thing to do was to put the prisoners to death. Just kill them. You don't have to worry about them escaping that way. But you know, the word of God spoken through Paul had made an impact. Enough of an impact that the leader of the soldiers is willing to tell them to just let the guys jump and make their way in the sea. Everyone grab onto something and make their way to the nearest island. That's what's happened. What an amazing example of the power of God's word to work among those that we find ourselves around, even if maybe on being on his way to Rome to be put on trial wasn't the first thing Paul would have chosen. Isn't it amazing how God used his word, how God used, how God used a difficult situation to do something good, something great? So what ends up happening is they land on the island of Malta. And as they land on the island of Malta, which you can see is right over there, kind of not too far from Sicily, they find themselves interacting with the people on the island there. And when they interact with the people of the island there, I think it's interesting to see the difference between the certainty of faith 
and, and the darkness of unbelief. We read about that in our next section in Acts chapter 28. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies that we needed. What a turnaround, huh? It goes from the Apostle Paul being bit by a snake by a fire, and everyone thinking that the reason that happened is because Paul was somehow cursed by God, a doomed man, and this was him getting what justice deserved. To suddenly in the next section, when he shakes the, the, the snake off, and then no ill effects are suffered, them thinking he's a god. Talk about fishing in the dark. I, you know, never underestimate the gift of the truth of God's word, that you have the objective reality of God's teaching there. That means you don't have to be ship, fishing in the dark like that. It means you don't have to change your views here and there as, as things around you change. You know who God is, you know who you are and where you stand with him. You see, Paul, by God's power, makes an impact on the island of Malta. And how many people are going to be in heaven, are we going to meet in heaven one day, that are there because Paul got shipwrecked on that island once again? Good. Coming from something very tragic. Well, it's time for them to set out. And I think this verse is interesting. It's, it's, it's verse 11 of Acts chapter 28. It says, After three months we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux were the, the two sons of Zeus, reportedly according to Greek mythology. And, uh, and they were also the, 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 the guardians or the gods of sailors. But I wonder if when they got on that ship and they saw the two heads of those gods, if perhaps the soldiers and the prisoners there had a, a better idea of who their guardian truly was. As we look at this next map, we have an example of where they go next. So we get a chance to see they go from Malta, and then they head kind of up through that gap between Sicily and the mainland of, of Italy, and they make their way up to Rome. And when Paul gets to Rome, he ends up meeting with some of the Christians who are there, and ends up meeting with some of the Jews that are there. And we see the very same thing play out there that plays out in all the towns that Paul goes to. We continue reading in Acts chapter 28. Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It's because of the hope of Israel that I'm bound with this chain. You know, when Paul was on the island of Malta, we get a chance to see a certain kind or, or a certain manifestation of the darkness of unbelief. Huh? It shows in their, their silly superstitions and the way they, they go from thinking Paul is cursed to thinking he's a god in just a matter of minutes. But there's another kind of darkness of unbelief we see here. When Paul finds himself once again among the Jews living in that area, you see, these people, even though they had the Old Testament, they somehow had so walked away from the truth that when the truth about Jesus is shared, they just don't want to hear it. You see, sometimes the darkness of unbelief doesn't show itself in those silly superstitions. It looks very religious, and yet it's just as dark and just as blind. We continue reading about Paul's conversation with the people there in Rome. 
They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Just in case you think maybe this is a unique thing that Paul just faces everywhere he goes, this is just how it goes for the messengers of the gospel. If you go back to the Old Testament, it was that way for Elijah and Elisha. As they went around and they, they shared the word of God, that there were some in Israel who were Israel by name, but, but they rejected what the prophets said. They weren't truly the true Israel that were the people of God. But there were others who heard and who believed. We see that throughout the book of Acts. We see that in our lives as well. How oftentimes the same word of God, the same promise of God that inspires a human heart to believe also can be rejected by another person. And yet even that tragedy, God finds a way to use for good. Look what Paul says next. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul made his final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors. When he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You'll be ever hearing but never understanding, ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. Even there, the Apostle Paul reminds them of what God said in the book of Isaiah, something that these people would have known very well. That when you reject God's word, when you push God away, then finally, sometimes the foreign work of the word of God is to harden people in their unbelief. I mean, you can only slap God so many times in the faith before he finally starts to push you away, huh? Before the Holy Spirit just says he's just had enough. You see, the more Paul preached the truth to them, the more he used things like Isaiah 53 and the picture of the suffering servant to compare it to Jesus' crucifixion, the more that they didn't want to hear it, the more angry they became. And yet the same word would mean salvation to so many. In fact, as Paul finds himself kicked out of the synagogue, guess what happens? The gospel goes to somewhere else. We read about that in the final verses of, of Acts. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. It started with Paul going to Jerusalem, not knowing what he'd find there, to Paul being nearly killed in, in, a, in a riot, to him being taken from place to place and trial after trial, to him being shipwrecked on an island, to suddenly there being in Rome and having two years to preach the gospel. You see, in this case, he didn't seem to be in a, in a, in a jail cell. He was in a house he rented, and possibly with a Roman soldier literally chained to him. He references that in some of his letters. But what a benefit it was to have Paul there. How many people are you going to meet in heaven one day who are there because the Apostle Paul was sent to Rome? You see, God finds a way of taking the most difficult, the, the most tragic thing, and still using it for the good of his church. In Scripture, God peels back the curtain. He lets us know exactly how. But just because in life he doesn't do that doesn't mean he's not still doing that. He promised he would. And God always does what he says. Thank you for joining us for our series on the book of Acts. I hope it was an opportunity for you to study it once more, to maybe gain some insights you hadn't seen before, and to see the amazing ways our God works through his church and through the power of his word. hope you'll join us for our final Bible study this coming Saturday after our worship service at 5.30 or this coming Sunday after our worship service at 9, 9 a.m. The Bible study will be about 10.15. Lord's blessings on the rest of your day.